Quantum mechanics is the study of matter and its interactions with energy on an atomic and subatomic level. Unlike classical physics, which explains the behavior of everyday objects and even astronomical bodies, quantum mechanics deals with phenomena that are quite different and often counterintuitive. Back in the late 19th century, scientists began to notice that classical physics couldn't explain certain phenomena. This led to a revolution in our understanding of the natural world and the birth of quantum mechanics. One of the most famous quantum physicists, Richard Feynman, even said that quantum mechanics deals with nature as she is absurd. Ever heard of the uncertainty principle? It says that you can't precisely measure both the position and the velocity of a particle at the same time. The more accurately you know one, the less accurately you can know the other. Another fascinating concept is entanglement. Imagine two particles that have a shared history. If you measure one particle's property, like its spin, you'll instantly know the spin of the other particle, no matter how far apart they are. It's as if they communicate faster than the speed of light. Quantum mechanics isn't just theoretical, it has practical applications too. One of the coolest phenomena explained by quantum mechanics is superfluidity. For example, if you cool liquid helium to near absolute zero, it can flow without friction, even climbing up and over the sides of its container. Classical physics can't explain that. But let us talk about what exactly is wave-particle duality. Simply put, it's the concept that neither the classical idea of a particle nor that of a wave can fully describe the behavior of quantum-scale objects, whether they are photons or matter. This duality is an example of the principle of complementarity in quantum physics. One of the most famous experiments demonstrating wave-particle duality is the double-slit experiment. Originally performed by Thomas Young in 1803 and later by Augustin Fresnel, this experiment involves directing a beam of light through two narrow, closely spaced slits. The result is an interference pattern of light and dark bands appears on a screen, much like the patterns you see with water waves. This was seen as a clear demonstration of the wave nature of light. But the story doesn't end there. Variations of the double-slit experiment have been carried out using electrons, atoms and even large molecules. Astonishingly, the same type of interference pattern emerges, proving that all matter possesses wave characteristics. If you turn down the source intensity, the pattern will slowly build up. So, what's happening here? The quantum system acts as a wave when passing through the double slits, but as a particle when it is detected. This is a hallmark of quantum complementarity. A quantum system behaves like a wave in experiments designed to measure its wave-like properties and like a particle in experiments designed to measure its particle-like properties. The point on the detector screen where any individual particle shows up is the result of a random process. Yet the overall distribution pattern of many individual particles mimics the diffraction pattern produced by waves. Let's shift our focus to another cornerstone of quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle. Imagine you're trying to measure the position and speed of a car as it zooms through a radar speed trap. In classical physics, you might assume that with advanced measuring equipment, you could pinpoint both its position and speed with utmost precision. But in the quantum realm, things aren't that simple. In 1927, Werner Heisenberg shattered this classical assumption with his uncertainty principle. Heisenberg showed that certain pairs of physical properties, like position and speed, cannot be measured simultaneously with arbitrary precision. The more accurately you measure one, the less accurately you can measure the other. To understand this, let's consider an electron. If you try to measure its position using a photon of light, the higher the frequency of the photon, the more precisely you can pinpoint the electron's position. But there's a catch. The impact of the high-frequency photon disturbs the electron, making its momentum, its speed multiplied by its mass, more uncertain. Conversely, if you use a lower-frequency photon, the disturbance to the electron's momentum is less, but your measurement of its position becomes fuzzier. At the heart of the uncertainty principle is a fascinating trade-off. Achieving a sharper, more precise measurement in one domain, like position, requires contributions from more frequencies in the other domain, like speed. This trade-off becomes critical when dealing with the tiny scales of atoms and electrons, where the uncertainties are no longer negligible. Mathematically, the uncertainty principle shows 
that the product of the uncertainty in a particle's position and momentum can never be less than a certain value related to the Planck constant. Because of the uncertainty principle, statements about both the position and momentum of particles can only assign a probability that these properties have certain numerical values. Therefore, it's essential to distinguish between an indeterminate state, such as an electron in a probability cloud, and a state with a definite value. When an object can definitely be pinned down in some respect, it is said to possess an eigenstate. To illustrate this, let's revisit the stern gerlach experiment discussed earlier. The quantum model predicts two possible values of spin for the atom compared to the magnetic axis. These two eigenstates are arbitrarily named up and down. The quantum model predicts these states will be measured with equal probability, but no intermediate values will be observed. This is precisely what the stern gerlach experiment demonstrates. Interestingly, the eigenstates of spin about the vertical axis are not simultaneously eigenstates of spin about the horizontal axis. Consequently, an atom has an equal probability of being found to have either value of spin about the horizontal axis. As described earlier, measuring the spin about the horizontal axis can cause an atom that was spin up to spin down. Measuring its spin about the horizontal axis collapses its wave function into one of the eigenstates of this measurement. This means it is no longer in an eigenstate of spin about the vertical axis and can take either value. In 1924, Wolfgang Pauli proposed a new quantum degree of freedom or quantum number to address inconsistencies between observed molecular spectra and the predictions of quantum mechanics. Specifically, the spectrum of atomic hydrogen exhibited a doublet, a pair of lines differing by a small amount where only one line was expected. To explain this phenomenon, Pauli formulated his exclusion principle stating, there cannot exist an atom in such a quantum state that two electrons within it have the same set of quantum numbers. A year later, physicists Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith identified Pauli's new degree of freedom with the property known as spin. This property was observed in the stern gerlach experiment which we discussed earlier. The concept of spin introduces another layer of complexity to our understanding of quantum mechanics, but it is crucial for explaining why electrons in atoms occupy distinct states. The Pauli exclusion principle has profound implications for the structure of atoms and the behavior of matter. It explains why electrons fill orbitals in a specific order and why certain elements exhibit unique chemical properties. Without this principle, the periodic table as we know it would not exist and the diversity of matter in the universe would be vastly different. In 1928, Dirac extended the Pauli equation, which described spinning electrons, to account for the principles of special relativity. This extension was crucial for accurately describing events occurring at speeds close to the speed of light, such as the rapid orbit of an electron around a nucleus. By incorporating the simplest electromagnetic interactions, Dirac was able to predict the magnetic moment associated with an electron spin. Remarkably, he found the experimentally observed value, which classical physics could not explain. Dirac's work also provided solutions for the spectral lines of the hydrogen atom and reproduced Sommerfeld's formula for the fine structure of the hydrogen spectrum from physical first principles. However, Dirac's equations sometimes yielded a negative value for energy, a puzzling result at the time. To address this, Dirac proposed a novel solution. The existence of an anti-electron, now known as a positron and a dynamic vacuum, this groundbreaking idea paved the way for the development of many particle quantum field theory. Imagine a group of particles interacting or being created together in such a way that the quantum state of each particle cannot be described independently of the state of the others, even when separated by vast distances. This is known as quantum entanglement. An early and pivotal moment in the study of entanglement was the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen paradox, a thought experiment proposed by Albert Einstein Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen in 1935. They questioned whether the quantum mechanical description of physical reality could be considered complete. In their paper, they argued for the existence of elements of reality that were not part of quantum theory and speculated about a more complete theory containing these hidden variables. The EPR paradox involves a pair of particles prepared in what we now call an entangled state. If the position of the first particle is measured, the result of measuring the position of the second particle can be predicted with certainty. Similarly, if the momentum of the first particle is measured, 
the momentum of the second particle can also be predicted. They argued that no action taken on the first particle could instantaneously affect the other, as this would involve information being transmitted faster than light, which contradicts the theory of relativity. Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen proposed the EPR criterion of reality, stating that if we can predict the value of a physical quantity with certainty without disturbing the system, then there exists an element of reality corresponding to that quantity. From this, they inferred that the second particle must have definite values of both position and momentum before either is measured. However, quantum mechanics considers these two observables incompatible and does not associate simultaneous values for both to any system. Thus, they concluded that quantum theory does not provide a complete description of reality. In the same year, Erwin Schrödinger coined the term entanglement and declared it the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics. Irish physicist John Stuart Bell later carried this analysis further, deducing that if measurements are performed independently on the two separated particles of an entangled pair, the assumption that the outcomes depend on hidden variables within each half implies a mathematical constraint known as the Bell inequality. Bell showed that quantum physics predicts correlations that violate this inequality. Experiments based on Bell's ideas have demonstrated that nature obeys quantum mechanics and violates Bell inequalities, indicating that hidden variables, if they exist, must be non-local, allowing the two particles to interact instantaneously, regardless of distance. The standard model of particle physics is the quantum field theory that describes three of the four known fundamental forces in the universe. Electromagnetic, weak and strong interactions, excluding gravity. It classifies all known elementary particles and was developed in stages throughout the latter half of the 20th century through the work of many scientists worldwide. The current formulation was finalized in the mid-1970s upon experimental confirmation of the existence of quarks. Since then, proof of the top quark in 1995, the tau neutrino in 2000, and the Higgs boson in 2012 have added further credence to the standard model. Additionally, the standard model has predicted various properties of weak neutral currents and the W and Z bosons with great accuracy. Although the standard model is believed to be theoretically self-consistent and has demonstrated success in providing experimental predictions, it leaves some physical phenomena unexplained and so fall short of being a complete theory of fundamental interactions. For example, it does not fully explain baryon asymmetry, incorporate the full theory of gravitation as described by general relativity, or account for the universe's accelerating expansion as possibly described by dark energy. The model does not contain any viable dark matter particle that possesses all of the required properties deduced from observational cosmology. It also does not incorporate neutrino oscillations and their non-zero masses. Accordingly, it is used as a basis for building more exotic models that incorporate hypothetical particles, extra dimensions, and elaborate symmetries such as supersymmetry to explain experimental results at variance with the standard model, such as the existence of dark matter and neutrino oscillations. While the physical measurements, equations and predictions pertinent to quantum mechanics are consistent and hold a high level of confirmation, the question of what these abstract models say about the underlying nature of the real world has received competing answers. These interpretations are widely varied and sometimes quite abstract. For instance, the Copenhagen interpretation states that before a measurement, statements about a particle's properties are completely meaningless. It's as if the particle exists in a state of probability until we observe it. On the other hand, the many worlds interpretation describes the existence of a multiverse made up of every possible universe. According to this view, every quantum event branches into a different universe, creating an infinite number of parallel realities. Light, for example, behaves in some aspects like particles and in others like waves. Matter, the stuff of the universe consisting of particles such as electrons and atoms, exhibits wave-like behavior too. Some light sources, such as neon lights, give off only certain specific frequencies of light, a small set of distinct pure colors determined by neon's atomic structure. Quantum mechanics shows that light, along with all other forms of electromagnetic radiation, comes in discrete units called photons and predicts its spectral energies and the intensities of its light beams. A single photon is a quantum or the smallest observable particle of the electromagnetic field. 
a partial photon is never experimentally observed. More broadly, quantum mechanics shows that many properties of objects, such as position, speed and angular momentum, which appeared continuous in the zoomed-out view of classical mechanics, turn out to be quantized in the very tiny, zoomed-in scale of quantum mechanics. Such properties of elementary particles are required to take on one of a set of small, discrete, allowable values. Since the gap between these values is also small, the discontinuities are only apparent at very tiny, atomic scales.